Okay, so sorry for the delay, guys. Uh, my name is Frederick. I'm Mitchell. Uh, and we're going to be talking to you guys about Git today. Uh, so, what in the world is Git? Git is a version control. Basically, what what is version control? Uh, let me pull up my notes. There we go. Um, so version control is basically you have software. You want to keep it. You want you want to know what happened. You don't want to lose your uh, you don't want to lose your your code. You want to keep your history. You want to know what happened when somebody breaks something. You want to know well what did they do to change it. And that's why you want version control. It lets you keep track of your history of your software. And that's what Git is. Um, so one of the things that you see um, with Version, with version control in particular Git is it's what's called distributed version control um, and that means that it's not unlike some other softwares it doesn't have to talk to a central server you don't have to talk your, your organization or you don't have to set up a central server somewhere that then your computer talks to and gets updates from and gets information from and it's a pain because well obviously you don't want to have to talk over the internet every single time you want to do anything on Git. So Git has, has the full repository on your local computer, and that makes things really quickly. Some other uh, version control systems you may have heard of, CVS, really, really, really old. Um, if you're using it, I feel sorry. Um, SVN, uh, again, old, newer than, newer than uh, CVS, but still pretty old. Th those are both centralized solutions. Um, uh, Mercurial, which is the other main uh, distributed version control system that is not Git, um, and many people say it has a nicer interface than Git, but I know Git, so that's what I'm teaching. Um, and the most pe most people do end up using Git. Um, and then TFS is Team Foundation Server. It's a Microsoft-based solution. Um, it's a it's a centralized server, but it's very new, and it does a whole bunch of things other than uh, version control. It does a lot of other. Uh, if you in soft engine, if you learn about the whole development process, it does a lot of those things as well. Okay, so Git it's distributed. Uh, it's got lots of documentation. Like seriously, um, there's not only is there a lot of documentation, but there's a lot of well, I don't understand what the documentation is telling me. Let me Google this error. Oh, there's a there's a page on Stack Overflow that tells me exactly what the error means and how to fix it. Um, and branching is very lightweight. Uh, so we can create tons of new branches and there are basically no overhead to doing so. And that allows teams to continue to work on different parts of software uh, at the same time without having to have tons of merge conflicts and all sorts of different errors. Unlike with SVN where uh, branching is very high overhead. Uh, it actually does a whole bunch of things on the back end that is, makes it a pain when you're trying to do branching. Um, yeah. uh, that, uh, there's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of third-party tools. Uh, you have GUIs that, that do uh, uh, visual window-based management of Git. Uh, there's all sorts of different command line extensions. You, Git, Git is very extendable. You can put hooks in to happen after, after commits, after pushes, after all sorts of different things. Uh, for example, if you're using Ruby on Rails and you use Heroku, you can actually have it such that when you commit to the repository, uh, it will auto push to a web server and automatically update your page. So you don't have to do anything. It just it just happens by doing a git push. Um, and it's very, very, very hard to lose information with git. Um, if you, even if you manage to royally screw things over, as long as you haven't deleted your dot git, the, the little hidden dot git directory, the information is probably still there. Um, it is very, very hard to lose information because it doesn't delete anything. How does Git work? Where are all of our notes? Okay, yes, there. Yeah. Um, okay, so Git is a directed graph of commits. So if you look at, and we'll show some some more interactive examples on the screen a little later. But um, if we look at this, you see C1, right? C1 at the very back of history, and that's your first commit. It doesn't have a parent. It's the first commit. Then C2, C3, everything is branching off of it and basically commits point to their previous. So it's a big graph. And branches point to specific commits. We'll get into how that works a little bit later. But um, it's, it's, it's a giant directed graph 
and that is how commits refer to each other. Um, so branches are just pointers to commits, um, and commits are immutable. This means you cannot change a commit. Once you make a commit, it's that way forever. That particular commit is always going to be, is always going to have that hash, it's always going to have that commit, commit author, it's always going to have all of those same properties. It, you cannot change it. But that doesn't mean you can't go back and rewrite history in certain ways because you can, so the, the little the rectangles right there are the actual, so branch pointers, which, uh, how many of you guys actually know what a branch is? So basically it's kind of a, what a slide on it. Okay. okay. So um, creating a local repository. So this is the first thing that you would ever want to do with Git. Um, and basically, so we have we have this directory. Um, if Mitch can type, um, so we have this directory, and we want to store some code in here, right? We want to store uh, some files, and now we're we're in this directory, and all we have to do to make a Git repository is the command git init. Ta-da! We now have a Git repository. That's all that needed to be done. There was no centralized server to set up. No, no. Uh, commands to go run on some other on some other person's stuff. No, you didn't need to go into GitHub and make a new repository. That is a new repository that is full that will work and do everything Git can do. Um, so, um, and if we you don't see anything right now because there is a hidden Git folder. But if we do an ls a, you can see that there's a. Uh, or ls-a, ls-l, whichever works. Um, you can see we have a hidden folder called git. This is dot. Uh, on Linux, this hides it. If you use git bash on Windows, generally it will hide the, uh, it will set the folder to be hidden using Windows system properties as well. Um, so you generally won't see it unless you have hidden file views turned on. Um, but that is where git stores all of your information. Okay. So, Making a commit. So basically, now we have some code, and we're going to use we're going to use this uh, great online tool that kind of does some interactive displaying of the graph as things change, um, and this makes it really easy to understand how things are working. Um, and if you want the URL to this, they have a whole bunch of demos for how to learn Git and branching and stuff. Let us know, and we can send that to you. Um, so the simplest making a commit is saving the repository, saving the history, the current state of the repository at a specific point in time. So the command for that is git commit. And we're putting in a message with the dash m command. Uh, you need a space there, because it doesn't actually support that. Yeah, OK. So we made a new commit. We saved the version, we saved the state of the repository at this point in time. And now we have a new commit. And if we do a git log, which shows everything that uh, this shows history, we can see commit one. We have we have uh, commit two actually. It's actually named C two, but it has a message of C one, and we can see it has some stuff. It has the author uh, on this on this demo online. It's pre canned, but in the real world, it would be your name. Uh, it we have the date that it was created. We have a hash for it. That C2 here, uh, in your local repository, it will be uh, a SHA-1, a very long SHA-1 hash. Um, and this is really small. I don't know why this is this small. Okay. Over here. okay, that's better. Um, well, I'm trying to read it. Oh. <laughs> um, and it also points to the parent commit. So we can see C2 points to C1. C1 points to C0. Um, and basically, that's how, that's how Git commands, or that's how Git commits know their history, and that's how we build up the graph. So if we do another commit, we now have a new commit, and another Git log shows us, oh hey, commit C3, or yep, C3, it has a message of commit 2, it has an author, it has a new date, um, and it tells us all of this information, uh, and again, it's immutable, so these commits are fixed in history. So, branching. Now let's say we have two teams that they want to work. They want to work on different parts of the application together. Branches are essentially pointers to commits. 
and commits have a history and they have a branch and they, they have a they have a graph. So if we make a new branch, okay, notice we added a new tag there. So it, we have feature one and master. Those are two branches. Master, there's nothing special about the name. It's just master. We, we treat it specially because we want to, but there's nothing special about it at all. Um, so if we then make a new commit, now we, we checked out master again, and we made a commit on master. And now feature one still points to C1 because it hasn't changed. But now we've made a new commit on master, so master was moved to the next commit. So now let's say our other team's been working on some stuff. So they've been working on our feature one branch, and they check out that they, they make a commit on that branch. So first we want to check out that branch. So checking it out basically, so we'll, we'll do a demo in an actual Git repository in a little bit, but checking it out basically makes it what's on your file system, so what you can edit with a text editor or something like that. So if we make it, and the star represents next to the name which one's checked out. So now we have two separate branches. And somebody has been working in master and somebody has been working in feature one. And they both, C2 and C3, because they both have different hashes, different names, they both point to C1 as their parent commit. So they have nothing to do with each other. And we can keep working down each line of this branch. Uh, so I can be working on, on master, and Mitch, Mitch can be working on feature one and making all these commits. And we're never going to run into merge conflicts because they're different. They're different pieces of code. So we keep we keep moving on down. Um, so, what information is stored in a branch? Basically, it's just a pointer to a commit. That's it. That's all a brancher is. A branch is. It's a pointer to a commit, and it has a name. That's it. So, uh, some commands you'll probably want to know for. Get, uh, for checking out, you want to know git branch. Git branch will make a new branch, will not switch you to a branch. It does not change your repository in any way. It just creates a new branch. Then there's git checkout. Uh, git checkout uh, branch name switches your repository to that branch. So now notice we're, we're now on feature one. And then git checkout dash b creates a new branch with the given name. So git checkout dash b name and it creates a new branch and switches you immediately to that branch. So now we've created feature 3 and we've immediately switched to feature B. So that's probably a good shortcut to remember. Okay. So, merging. Formally, the definition of merging is taking the union of two or more commits, so all the things in common and all the things separate, and making them, making them one commit. So it's the, lo it's the logical union of two commits. And basically what we want to do is we have two separate, Mitch and I have been working on two separate features. He's been working on the UI, I've been working on the back end. We want to make them, we want to put them together, right? Um, so we want to take features from multiple commits, put them into a single repository, single commit. Um, so what do we want to do? Uh, we want to do use the git merge command. Um, so we want to check out a feature branch, for example, uh, and we want to merge another, so, so we've been working in feature one for a while, right, or excuse me, feature three for a while, and we're ready for feature one to catch up to it. So we do a git merge feature one, because we are already in feature three. That's the wrong Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, yeah, I went the wrong way. Um, so we want to be in feature, we're in feature one, and we're ready to catch up with the stuff that's in feature three. This is the first type of merge. It is called fast forward because there is nothing actually changed. Notice that where before feature one pointed to C4, now it points to C6. It's just moved forward in history. There's no real, there's no uh, separate sources of information. It's just moved up to its parent, to its, to its child pointer. This is called a fast forward merge because there's no conflicts generally. <coughs> Uh, you'd really have to try hard to make fast forward have conflicts. You can't. You can't. Um, like you'd have to rewrite Git. Um, but so so fast forwards are very simple, and it's what happens when you pull from a remote repository into your local repository. It fast forwards you up to the latest version. Uh, the next type of merge is a true merge. This means that you're taking 
two diverged lines. So for example, we have, we, we're in our master branch and we're ready for all the features that have been worked on in feature one. We're ready for them to come and be part of our branch. So we want to merge feature one into master. And this is where you get merge conflicts if you've ever had with mer if you've ever had merge conflicts and working with Git. You can get errors when attempting to merge stuff in because you have diffs. And you wrote A over here and he wrote B over there. And which one does Git want to accept? It doesn't know. It's not you. So it makes a merge conflict and you have to go fix that. But if we want to merge feature one into master, it creates a new commit. This specifically creates a new commit, and this commit is a combination of what was C5 and C6, and it is now a commit called C7. Pretty straightforward. Um, and notice that feature one is still pointing to C6. It wasn't moved. The only branch that was moved is master. Okay. Um, so, next thing we're going to talk about is rebasing, which is a bit more complicated. Okay, so let's make a. Let's, Mitch is going to work on creating a bit of history for us while we talk about what a rebase is. So basically, we have two branches, right? Two, just like we looked at in the last example, we have two branches. But what we want to do, seriously, can I make this thing bigger? I can't read this slide. Oh, that yeah. I yeah, I tried. I don't. That's not helpful. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stand back here so I can read the slide. Um, so basically what we want to do is we want to replay a set of commits. So rather than just doing a straightforward merge, we want to take our, our set of commits and we want to essentially put them on top of another branch. So before where we had a new commit that, was, that came here and we had two branches that came in here and into one branch, what we want to do is we want to end up with one straight line of history. And this can be very useful for keeping your history sane. Because when you, when you do lots and lots and lots of merges, it, you have things going from here to there and there to here, and the graph gets very, very complex. Even, even a, good, um, a good understanding of Git and a proper uh, pattern that, you're, that you or your company or whoever uses to keep things sane can still leave your history very, very nonlinear and hard to follow. Um, and there, there are a lot of people who are of the opinion that fast forward merges on master, or excuse me, that, that um, merge, merge commits on master are a very bad thing. Um, so what do we do? We do the rebase command. What rebase does is, is it takes and why don't, why don't we show an animation speaks a million words if a picture speaks a thousand words. Okay, so what do we do? We want to rebase feature one, which is currently checked out, onto master. So we found the, the common history. C1 was the starting node between that where, where our two branches diverged. And it took all of the commits in the chain that is feature one. So C7, C6, C5, and it replayed them on top of master. And so now it created a new, note the word new, not changed, new. It created a new C5. And instead of C5 pointing to C1, C5 now points to C4, C6, and everything else is still the same. It's actually, C, you can't really see it on here, but it's C5 prime, and in an actual Git repository, it would be a different hash. So all the commits are referred to by hashes, which are just simplified by C number here. Yeah, and notice, notice that these still exist. And in your repository, these commits actually do still exist. You can find them. And you can go back to them, too. We'll talk yep. about that in a little bit. Yep, nothing is ever lost. But now, if we were to check out master, and we were to do a merge into feature one, if merge of feature one, it's a fast forward update. So now our history is a straight line, which is far cleaner to think about than a giant interconnected web of, of all sorts of different merges. Um, and we can also use git commit or git rebase to reorder and remove commits remove, 
commits from our history. So say we want say we want to say C6 was a whole bunch of print lines, right? And we don't want to include all of these. These are just debug print lines. We don't want to include them in our final repository because why would we want to have all of these print lines in our final code? We don't want our customers seeing all this stuff on the console. Um, so we can we can reorder and remove commits from the past with git rebase dash i, which stands for interactive. And we're going to use a shortcut. So head head just refers to where we're currently pointed. If I think of this star as head. This is what the repository is currently at. And then the caret, caret, caret just stands for go three commits above head. Now, you don't have this nice UI in real GIF, but um, the website does the best that it can. So we don't want C6, we said. So C6 is going to go away. And then let's say we want to reorder C5 and C7. So we can confirm that. And now, master just has C5, C7. There are two primes there now because we've rewritten this history again. So our print lines are no longer there, thankfully. And uh, feature one still has these print lines, which is probably pretty good because we probably want to continue working on whatever the feature was, and maybe we need to continue debugging it. So I think this is where I take over. Yep. So this is an empty repo. All right. So um, we've been doing demos in this kind of cheesy little nice area to kind of demo things in. Um, but we want to actually like write some code, right, and commit it. So let's see. So we're gonna. Um, let's see. So we're gonna talk about the staging area. So basically, before you commit. Um, uh, files uh, and git, you have to first add them to what's called the staging area. So um, basically this allows you to selectively commit things. Um, so maybe you don't want to add all your binaries to the repository, right? Because those will get big and there's no reason to have them there. And, um, so basically uh, you have to explicitly add um, you have to explicitly add files oh, to not really what? The red isn't really readable. Oh, if I highlighted, it works. Okay. Oh, that works. <laughs> All right. Um, so basically, uh, files aren't automatically added to it. You can add them automatically. And so basically, um, a couple useful commands here are, so if you run git status um, as, oh, it's like cut off, too. Um, so if you run git status here, it basically tells you what branch you're on. So that's the first line. We're on branch master. Um, and then it says, this is the first commit because this is a brand new repository. And then it tells you about untracked files. So these are files that are not yet in the repository. So the untrack, under untracked files is this file that Fred just created. Um, and so now if we go ahead and add it to the, so git add will add files to the staging area. So now if we run git stats again, you can see changes to be committed. Um, so now we see new file feature.txt. And you can also see Git tries to be helpful sometimes. And you can see like here, it tells you what you need to do to like add things to be committed and stuff. So now if we actually want to go ahead and commit um, this change in this new file that we made, we just run the same git commit dash m. Da so dash m basically um, just lets you specify a message on the command line. If you don't put it there, it'll open up your favorite editor um, to and you can type in a message in the editor and then save it. So now we have a commit, and if we run git log, you can see we have a commit that I made. Um, so now let's make another edit to the file. Um, so we're going to add another line, and so now. That's giving me every time. Now, if we run git status again, we now see that the, we have changes that are not staged for commit. So this is different because the file is already in the repository, so it's not an untracked file. The changes just aren't staged yet. So is that more readable? So basically, the file is now listed as modified versus new file. So now, if we do git commit again, just do it without touching. Okay, so he ran, if you caught that there, he ran git commit dash a, which automatically adds all tracked files 
to um, the staging area and then does a commit. So here we didn't specify dash m on the command line, so it opened up the editor that I specified um, in my bash rc file I, uh, to add a commit message. So now if we add a commit message here and then we save this file and exit it. <laughs> I was thinking it was not, I think it was nano for a second. Nope. I don't know why. Um, so now we made a commit. Now we have two commits. Awesome. So how would I change the default game editor? Because I don't know how to Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. You probably want to do that, don't you? Um, I forgot about that. So, um, well, so actually, it's different on the CCC machines. Um, so the CCC machines. So basically, there's a script that gets run when you first log in to uh, Linux boxes. So, in like Ubuntu or a bunch of Linux distributions, it's normally dot dot bash rc in your local directory. Um, or sorry, in your home directory. Um, on the CCC machines, it's dot bash underscore profile, just because it's got to be annoying. Oh, I have lots but of it here. You can call bash profile from other locations if you're logging into other things. So Yeah, there's, there's lots of ways you can look up. But basically, you, how you need to do, how you can change which editor you use in Linux is to simply do, um, you have a line like this that's, oh, it's cut off, um, export, and then the base, which basically sets an environmental variable called editor to the string Emacs. So that's what command you want to run. So you could say export editor equals vim, export editor equals nano, whatever your favorite text editor is. Gedit you could do. Um, so any of those work. Um, so that, so another thing, so let's make another change. And so another way that we can add things to the staging area. Um, so your editor oh. is listed as Emacs. Yes. But you're running Nano right now. Well, yes, uh, because I'm not him. So he <laughs> so he ran Nano from the command line by typing Nano and then the name of the file. Whereas what editor is is basically what the editor environmental variable is basically is where Git looks to see what editor should I launch okay. to prompt the so user to enter text. If you do Git commit without dash m, it will be. Yeah. So yeah. So we'll do. So we'll do that in a second again, and you'll see it'll be Emacs. Um, so a different way that we can add things to the staging area is by doing git um, add dash u, which basically adds all tracked, which is just kind of a different way of adding tracked files. So before a change is not staged for commit, we run git add dash u, and now we staged it for commit. Um, and so now if we run git commit again. Oh, not. Oh. Can we reset? Oh, okay, fine. Okay, we're not going to run git commit. <laughs> so, uh, so now, what if we want to like get rid of these changes, though, right? So we didn't like the changes we made, and we want to restore it to what it was in the previous commit or the current commit. So the commit that we currently have viewed, which then these changes are put on top of. So basically, we what we can do is if we run git reset head. So head is basically um, the branch or the branch or commit or um, or you can put head, which basically says the current commit. Um, basically, you can in a lot of Git, there's places where it accepts this kind of fuzzy argument that refers to a commit in some way, whether it be indirectly through a branch name or directly through the actual commit hash. So if we do this. Um, oh, it, so basically what this does is it unstages the, oh, because you didn't run. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so this unstages the um, single file from the staging area. And then if we want to um, restore the value, restore the contents of the file from the current commit, if you do git checkout, it's a little confusing because it's the same command that you use to um, check out a branch. If you do git checkout and then the name of a file, it will restore the contents of the file from the most recent commit. So now that line that he added is gone. So, um, all right, so git ignore. So let's say that we have files that um, we don't want to commit 
and oh, okay. um, we have files that we don't want to commit, like binaries. So you don't want to like if you have like a C plus plus project, you don't want to commit like your object files or your actual built files. Um, so what you can do is add a file called uh, git ignore file, which will basically tell git ignore these files. So basically, you can specify um, by name or by kind of a regex expression. Um, to ignore a set of files, so basically it won't even tell you that they've changed, that they've been modified, and that do you want to add them? It'll just show nothing has changed because it doesn't even look at them. So basically, um, online GitHub has a bunch of kind of example uh, Git ignore files for all kinds of different projects. So open one up. I don't even know what DM. DM is. I don't know what DM is. So basically, what, but what this uh, Git ignore file does is will basically tell Git to ignore all files that have that end in. So basically, star is matching kind of anything, and then it ends in dot DMB dot RSC dot INT. So any of those files, it'll ignore. And so basically, you can put a dot git ignore file in either the root of your repository, which will means it'll ignore it in the entire repository or in any folder of the repository, and that will cause it to ignore those files in that folder and all subfolders. So um, that's git ignore. Um, so yeah, you can go that link, find more git ignore files example getting more files. So now let's say we're working on some cool feature, but it's not quite ready to actually commit yet, um, but we want to like change task and do something else. Um, so there's this thing called the stash, which basically allows, it gives you a place that you can kind of put changes temporarily without actually making a commit. So we have, um, we have this change that we just made to the file. Um, but we don't want to actually commit it yet. So if we add it to the staging area. It's, it's tracked. So oh. Okay. So, um, so now all we have to do is run uh, git stash. And um, what that basically, so if the file's tracked, if you, it'll basically look at all of the tracked files um, and take them all and kind of make a secret commit that kind of just puts it puts them to the side for now and restores the repository to the currently checked out commit. Um, so if you look right now, we ran git status and nothing's changed. Um, we can create a new branch. We can make a commit. We can do, um, we can change some stuff. We can do whatever. Um, oh, OK. And then we can, so now we can do, we change some stuff. Make a commit, um, and so now it's, you're going to get a merge conflict. I don't think so. No. Oh, okay. So um, now we, where if you run, so basically the stash is a um, stack. So you can kind of you when you call git stash, you push a set of changes onto this um, stack, and then when you run git stash pop, it pops off the top one and you can go in and you can list all the commits or you can like pull one out selectively. Um, but so this kind of lets you store work temporarily and kind of bring it back later at some other point. Um, so that's stash. So now um, let's say things aren't going well, right? And someone else, let's say Fred's working on some files. I'm working on the same files for some reason, which I shouldn't be doing. But I make some changes, and he makes some changes. And let's say that they don't play. So that let's say I changed some line in some certain file, and Fred changed the same line. And now we go to merge our changes, right? So what's Git going to do? Git's like, you, but you guys both change. So Git tries really hard when you do a merge to merge things together nicely. So like if I've edited one part of the file and he edited another, it'll try to merge them um, the best it can. But it does a good job of then identifying when it really can't. Like if we both modified the same line in the file, um, you'll get what's called merge conflict. So basically, we have what Fred's setting up is um, a single file, and we create two branches, um, and then we modify the file to have um, one will say hello, and one will say goodbye. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, okay, well, so one says hello and one says different line. Um, and so now, So now we have uh, two commits, and so one of them's in the feature one branch, and one of them's in this new branch, right? So now we want to merge the changes from feature one into new branch, right? So if we run git merge, git's going to be like, tried to auto merge it, but oh no, got a conflict. Now what? So, oh, okay, I was going to say git status, but yeah. So if you run git status, it um, will be like, It'll tell you you have a conflict, and it'll tell you here's the file that's in conflict. Um, so you have an unmerged path, both sides, so both branches, both parts of the merge modify the file. Um, so basically, it's telling you you need to go fix this. So if you go in and open up the file, you'll see that Git basically puts this nice little. So if there was more contents of the file, it would be above or below those lines. Um, so it basically says the incoming stuff from the branch I'm on, so head, is different line, and then the stuff coming from feature one is hello. So basically what you do is you edit this file until it looks like what you want the final output to be. So like let's say we want each of those two lines to be one after another, we can do that and you kind of just remove the little bit of um, mar the markers that Git puts in there to tell you this came from this branch, this came from that branch. You just save it, and then you make a you add the file to the staging area, and then you just commit, and then that completes. Uh, so now it changes to be committed, and now when you run git commit, it says it kind of adds fills in a message automatically saying that you merged feature one into new branch. Um, and so now we have a couple different um, commits, and if you actually run git tree. Um, this is in a normal, oh, come on, really? Can you highlight that? Uh, yeah. uh, so basically, you'll see it merged. It, yeah, you can't, oh. it's, cutting it off. it's cutting it off. There's a nice, pretty picture on the side here. I can <laughs> see it, he can see it, none of you can see it. <laughs> it will um, be on the recording, because the recording will see it. Yeah, <laughs> um, but so basically, it was that same kind of thing when we were working in that interactive environment where we had the, diverging branches and then we merged one and back into the other and so this just successfully did that with uh, merge which with issues with merging so um, let's say oh crap now like I really messed up right so let's say that um, let's see so let's say that like so it's really hard to lose data and get right because so as you saw even if we like rebased or like did a merge or like moved those branch pointers around, those old commits still existed somewhere in Git, right? Somewhere in that .git folder, the contents of those files at that point in time still exist. So it's really just about how to extract that information, right? So basically, so, so what I just did was I checked out master, which as you recall, has like git check out master again. This is way back in our history. We have two commits. We've we've done so many more things. We have we have like merge conflicts resolution in feature two. Then what I did here, git branch dash f feature one master, I said force feature one to now point to the same thing that master is pointing to. So we just lost all of the stuff that was in feature one. So if I git check out feature one. Oh no, what happened? We, we only have two commits. What happened to all of our commits? So now what do we do, right? We lost all our information. Got to go home and come back tomorrow and start over, right? No. So this is where um, the ref log comes in. So basically the ref log is a log of where the branch pointer has pointed. So if you see when we ran git log, you have this long stream, string of ugly numbers and letters. So that's that uh, sh, the shell tra one. Hat, yeah, shell shell one hash that um, <coughs> we were talking about that basically identifies each commit. So if we run git ref log show and then the name of a branch, you can actually see what commits um, the branch is pointed to. So a lot of times you can actually use a shortened version of that hash because that hash is really long, right? 
Um, and so you'll see the top one is actually the this second commit right here. So it's kind of cut off. But so this is that commit right there. Um, and so what we can do is we can do use the same git branch dash f to move the feature one branch back to the commit it was at. So we can re reference the commit by the beginning oh, of the can't, hash. Oh, can't. I'm on because I'm on. Oh, so you can't do it. So if you're on a branch, you can't kind of forcibly move the branch pointer around. So you have to be on a different branch, and then you can move the branch pointer around. And now if we go back into the feature one branch, um, we have our commits back. Yay. Um, and I guess we'll skip that for now because we're running low on time. But basically, um, there's ways that if you delete, even if you delete your branches, if you delete the branch, the ref log history actually also goes away. But Git also keeps track of where your head, so the pointer that of what you're currently looking at has been. So you can normally actually go back and actually restore those commits that way anyway. Because so the commits, it takes a while. It takes. Um, I think it's by default like 30 days before commits even have a chance of getting deleted. Um, so, because basically Git just kind of keeps them around in the, got, in the .git folder for a while. But it does a good job of trying to kind of compress the information um, so that it doesn't take up loads and loads of space. So now, say we actually want to like work with someone else, right? So, um, we can create a repos so um, you could create a repository on like GitHub, for example, which is an awesome place where you can create online uh, public or if you're a student, private um, online repositories, work with other people. Um, so if we want to get this repository, you just do git clone. Uh, shift insert. Oh, man. Uh, middle click. Middle click? Nope. Right click paste. Nope. What? Cutty, you're not being nice. Um, it's supposed to be middle click. The middle click opens the scroll wheel. Um, well, okay. This is annoying. Um, here, I, I actually have it. I have it cloned. Okay. Yeah. So you you do git clone, and then that git URL, which I just had. Um, so basically. Yeah. If you ran git clone in the slash tm in the total slash tmp repository, it would clone the entire contents of the online repository into that directory. Um, if, you, if, you get, if you get paste to work, yeah. <laughs> um, so basically, GitHub gives you a couple different URLs that you can put after git clone that'll basically tell it whether it authenticates over HTTPS or using SSH. Um, but if you so if over HTTPS you just put in your credentials every time and then SSH if you have SSH you can configure SSH IDs and stuff. Um, but so if we so now we have this repository it has a readme file in it yay. Um, so let's say we make a change. Um, so now we want to make a change we want to push it back to the server so that other people can see it, see it right. So. Now we edit the file and we do the same thing, make a commit. Um, you didn't add it. So Git will tell you if you try to make a commit without actually having anything staged. Um, and so now when we want to push the commit back to the server, um, oh. um, so that was just authenticating over SSH. Um, you run git push, and that'll push the commit back to the server. Um, and we see the readme has changed, and it's got nice bullet points. Yeah. So basically, what this does behind, if you actually run these commands in the other thing. Mm -hmm. and, um, so if we do reset clear. So this. Uh, So what this actually does behind the scenes, people can try to come in, is basically, so you can think of GitHub as the thing on the right. So it has a couple commits, and then we're locally. So what we just did is we made a commit, and then made another commit. And so now let's say we want to push those commits to the server. You run git push, and it basically 
puts those commits on the server. And so you get this handy branch that tells you where the server is called here it's o slash master. And normally, when you clone a repository, it'll be origin slash master. Um, and so now let's say that someone else does some work and pushes it to the server too, right? So they made a commit. And so now we want to get that commit so that we can see what they did. So if you run git pull, you'll get the, it'll pull all of the kind of pending changes that you don't have down, and then it'll actually run a merge. Uh, by default, it will run a merge um, of the origin slash master branch into your branch. So now let's say that you made a change and someone else made a change on the server. So now if you try to push your changes, Git will complain and tell you, no, you can't do that because it won't merge. So basically, if you run git pull, it will pull the commit and then it will do a merge, but it can't do a fast forward merge like it did before. And so it makes a new merge commit and now you can actually push this new merge. And so you can also, uh, if you do git pull dash dash rebase, you can also get it to do a rebase when it pulls so that it doesn't, um, so you don't get like kind of the ugly merge like that. Um, so git pull dash dash rebase. And so now it'll take that and it'll actually rebase it on top, rebase your changes on top of what came from the server. Um, so this is kind of a summary of a bunch of the commands we just ran. Um, if you want to add a new branch, put a new branch on the server, um, you ran, run git push dash u, then so the name of the remote, which is basically origin in most cases, you can also set up so that you can have push and pull to multiple servers um, or even to like a local file system. So you could have multiple git copies uh, on a single file system or on a shared file system. Um, so that's another way of kind of you can work in a team and have a kind of shared copy in a shared file system and you can push and pull to that file system directly. Um, so then, oh. So we just created a new branch called test1 on the, uh, on GitHub. Which, which if we refresh, you can see that. Um, so then the git directory, that hidden directory, it has, so basically that's where all of this kind of data is stored. Um, a lot of the really useful information you care about is actually in readable files. So a lot of the files in here are actually just plain text that you can read. So do, oh, that one's not useful. So do config. That one's not really nice. So basically the kind of main configuration for it kind of tells it where to go find, um, so like where to find the server, um, where the master branch is, and kind of just stuff like that. You'll, if you dig down, you can actually see all of the branch pointers and stuff as well. Um, and we get, we get yeah, yeah. Um, so there's other useful tools you can look into. There's GUIs that kind of visualize the um, history. Uh, there's ways you can globally configure settings for all your repositories. There's tags, which basically let you kind of mark specific commits. They're kind of like branches, but not really designed to kind of move around. Questions? I know that kind of went very fast, um, but we're going to post it all online as well. There's a grad class in here, unfortunately. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so Eclipse has some pretty nice um, Git support uh, built in that if you just um, the Eclipse Git, you can find um, a very nice uh, built in, a very nice uh, tool where you can make commits, view the history, and all that stuff.